Hello, hello, welcome, Jody. Hi, Christy. How you doing today? I am doing good. We got a little rain last night, so I'm happy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and we have a really nice, I'm in Ohio, we have kind of a nice, it's not a crisp fall morning, but the heat kind of went down. Mm -hmm. So we've just got this really beautiful day. So I'm looking forward to, can't have my window open yet, but I'm looking forward to opening those curtains and getting outside today. Yay! Great. Well, I hope you enjoy that after this. <laughs> I am. I'm going to take my dogs for a walk. Oh, yeah. Well, speaking of dogs, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I live in Ohio. Uh, my husband and I, I think our 40th anniversary is coming up in a year or two. Yeah. Congratulations. So, yes. And that, that, that takes work. It does take work. We, we're best friends, but you know, um, every relationship takes a lot of work. I have two grown kids um, and one of them is a mom and she has two kids. So I have two grandkids and I have two Australian shepherds who are my babies here. Um, and I've always, almost always worked from home other than the parenting classes that I do in the evenings and weekends. Um, I've always worked from home, so I love having uh, pets here too. They keep me company, so I appreciate that, especially in this this day and age of everybody working from home too. Yeah. So yeah, I've kind of been doing that even before the internet. So that was quite a challenge, but we won't, we won't talk the old days. I'm so <laughs> grateful for all the new days and all the new tech that we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another day, another whole conversation. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's that's great. I'm I'm super interested to dive in because that was something that you actually started kind of even before all the internet craze was a tool shop. Can you tell us how that started and how it's going? Sure. Um, it, it wasn't anything I intended to start. It's been one of those organic evolving things that's happened. Um, when I was growing up, my parents... Um, top parenting classes. My mom was the director of Christian ed at our church. They both were among maybe the first 50 parent educators in the country, uh, getting certified in the very first parenting curriculum. Um, and so I, as an eight-year-old or so, when they first took the class, I would help them make these little vignettes for their parenting class where I'd be the snotty nose bratty kid. And then they would demonstrate, you know, some communication or discipline tool. And <laughs> it was a hoot. We had so much fun. But I think I was, you know, kids that age are, are downloading, you you know, so I was like downloading this and being aware that parenting is something that you can be very conscious about, that there are more effective and less effective tools and that there's actual, that, and now there's even far more research than there was back then um, in terms of, of being effective and being more intentional in, in our parenting. Um, and for my parents, that was really important. Not only did they come from a, a period of time where they um, they weren't raised by bad parents, but they were not prepared for parenting. They didn't feel like the way they were parented really par prepared them. They were very rural farm kids um, and who were now transplanted into suburbia in the 60s. And it was the height of the hippie culture with my brother. He was a very stereotypical hippie. Um, and he ended up, and, and I don't, this could be a whole other story. And I want to make it a quick story. And I have a hard time making it a quick story. But he ended up, we didn't know until he was 25, that when he was nine, he experienced a traumatic event that he never told anybody about. So his behavior started to go off the rails. I was this typical non-traumatized kid. So all this parenting stuff was quote working with me, but then they were just my whole childhood, they were trying to help him and it just got worse and worse and worse. So the good news is that he eventually told someone what happened, his trauma was was treated and he now um, is um, has his master's degree in clinical counseling and is a clinical director at my mom's Christian Counseling Center and he helps other people uh, deal with sexual abuse and, and those kinds of things. So it's that's like one of those really amazing testimonial miracle stories that I really made short. But that was kind of my experience going into college. I wanted to study um, sibling abuse. I, obviously someone who has a lot of issues um, so I had didn't realize till I was older that I had trauma too from things that he did to, you know, just verbal. He didn't like physically abuse me or anything. But anyway, so I kind of had all of this. I was reading abnormal psychology books when I was 12 because my parents were going to college to get their degrees. Uh -huh. And that's all we had. We had like all the 1970s self-help, you know, um, Leo Biscaglia and love and hugging and transactional analysis. Like this is the stuff I was learning in junior and senior high. And so when I went into college, 
college, my professors were just fascinated with my background, um, that we had like dysfunction, but yet we had all this high level stuff and that I apparently was unscathed. So anyway, so I ended up really thriving in college and was asked to give my first talk on sibling abuse uh, my senior year. And I walk into the room and there's 200 PhD professors in there. And I mean, the most I've ever done is spoke in front of a classroom. Um, and my professor said, just look at me. Um, and so I did. I started to talk to her. And and that was my first speech. So public speaking has never been an issue for me ever since. Once you get indoctrinated that way, you're thrown into the deep end. So I've been public speaking ever since. Um, because of my degree in social work, I kind of did what most people do. I went into protective service as a caseworker right out of college. Um, and while I was saving up for master's and all that kind of stuff. And uh, after several years, um, I was in there for about five or so years, and then I had my first child, and I had accrued so much overtime that I was off for almost eight to nine months. And during that time, I bonded with my baby. I fell in love with him. I came down from this. I was in the sexual abuse unit. Um, so it was, I was on call 24 seven. Some of the kids on my caseload got kidnapped right before I went on maternity leave. And here I am, you know, if you recall, you know, anyone who's been pregnant, you know how you're nesting, you know, those last few. So this is like the high level of stress that I came out of. And then after nine months, I'm, my stress is down. I'm bonded with my baby. I'm loving it. And I just, my husband came home one day. I had a babysitter picked out to go back to, to work. And that's a whole other story. It ended up being, uh, someone who sat next to me in junior high and had moved away and she lived in this new city and I ended up, we ended up finding each other. That was another like weird, can't be a coincidence moment. Mm -hmm. So I would have been fine to go back to work. I just couldn't do it. And so my husband came home one day, he says, I remember the day. And I just said, I can't do this. I can't go back to that job. Um, I will do anything, you know, whether it's scrubbing toilets, whatever. And actually for a while, I just, uh, I was a seamstress for American Eagle and I did alterations. Um, so I did that for a while while I kind of figured out what was next. And um, I was lonely. I really missed being around people. There was no internet. Um, I was involved with the Leche League, but my youngest was getting to where he wasn't nursing anymore and I was going to be leaving that support group. So I said, I really want to um, create a support group for moms at home. And so I just started with that little group um, and it just grew. I mean, it really kind of exploded. The newspapers found out and did front page news articles. It was on TV. You know, before we knew it, you know, we were, we were all over the city and had multiple, you know, whatever. Um, and they said, uh, we would really like for all of us to kind of be more on the same page with our parenting because there's nothing more frustrating than going to a play group and you have one person yelling at their kid and another person not following through and being permissive. And we all really want to be intentional about our parenting. You know parenting. Will you teach us? And I had done a parenting class as a senior, as an intern. So that was when I started. And for the next eight years, kind of while I was learning as a parent and pulling all this research-based information in and just for my own knowledge, you know, learning how to do it. I ended up discovering, is the only way I can say it, I ended up discovering um, a system that, you know, when, when it's just you, you can do whatever research you need and make all your decisions just for you. But when you're teaching people, you've got to find something, you've got to find ways of presenting it to multiple people who are very diverse, who have, very, you know, in a way that they can make it their own. And so that was a skill that I developed of being able to, I created systems. I don't know if my brain just works that way, but I discovered um, a system for being able to have a, an overall parenting plan. It's very holistic. It's not only logical, but it's very intuitive. It um, promotes emotional development, um, but it's kind of like, you know, if you think about the journey of parenting um, being like a trip from, from you know, uh, New York to LA, you don't just head west. You know, you don't just get in your car and head west towards the sun. You do a little bit of planning. You kind of have a plan. Ideally, if you have a GPS, it kind of guides you and helps you. Doesn't mean you can't stop and smell the roses. Doesn't mean you can't, you know, do things or, or just be spontaneous. But you kind of have a plan that you're following. And that's what this became was a GPS for parenting that um, you, you once you learn the system, you can use it to prevent problems. And when problems arise, it's a very quick, it's almost like the ABC 
policies of first aid. You just ask a couple of quick questions, or I should say answer a couple of quick questions. And it helps you know in your situation with your child in that moment, what might be going on and just kind of points you in a direction. And then once you're going down that path, you're kind of in the right ballpark, on the right path, playing on the right team kind of thing, uh, or at least I shouldn't say right or wrong, but more effective. And it kind of points you in a direction that now, once you're in this zone, there's a lot of options that you have and pretty much anything that's in the balanced parenting style is going to be effective. And so it just kind of helps narrow down and helps parents make quicker decisions um, because sometimes when we base it just on emotion, um, or it, it, it really is holistic because I oftentimes, and we're going to be talking about um, anger and stress management, when we get stressed, when we get angry, our brains go offline, our logic goes offline. And so if we can sometimes also confuse emotion for intuition, and unless someone has really intentionally honed their intuition, there are times where what we think is intuition can actually be something else. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's helpful to have, you know, more than one way uh, that we consult in terms of making decisions um, in that moment that, that can um, just help be uh, kind of some checks, checks and balances, you know, of kind of uh, not just reacting, but also not just, oh, well, you know, if I don't do anything, it'll all, you know, well, sometimes we do need to do things <laughs> and sometimes yeah. it's helpful to know what to do. So, um, and I'm also, and I will admit, I am kind of a research snob in that um, I really do believe in the importance of using research-based uh, materials because, um, and I'm required um, to, well, so let me finish my, so after I did that for eight years, I ended up developing the curriculum Kind of, sort of. And then when it was time for me to go back to work, I still couldn't go back. I didn't want to go back to my regular job. I always tell them I couldn't, but really the truth is I didn't want to still. And so um, I, my nonprofit organization was running itself. So I turned that over to its members. Um, and then I was hired for a part-time job that was funded by United Way. They were looking for someone who would develop a parenting curriculum on their own time. <laughs> nobody like yeah right like who's gonna walk in the door with that and then I walk in the door and go oh I've been doing that for the last eight years and they were like oh okay like you're hired on the spot so <laughs> then what I got was a United Way funding and I got a United Way um, evaluation specialist who came up with evaluation methods to actually assess whether the program was effective or not and how to measure that. So that was invaluable. So that lasted for 10 years. We got amazing results. 30 years later, the results have remained consistent. There are some that are just kind of off the chart. So it's a highly effective program. We've got lots of statistics. It's, it was tested with all kinds of diverse parents. Um, since then, um, it's uh, gone, uh, people were saying, oh, it helps me in my marriage and it helps me in, you know, so that Blue, I call my system, my secret sauce system, I call the universal blueprint. And it started for parenting success, but then people found that it worked with their marriages. So it's also relationship success, you know, or adult relationships. And then because of my um, experience in protective service, when that grant ended, my supervisor said, I really think you need to show your curriculum to, it's called the Ohio Child Welfare Training Program. It's the state program who trains the foster parents and caseworkers in our state who are involved with protective services. And she said, I really think you ought to show them your curriculum, which at that point, I had almost 40 hours of content, very advanced oh, wow. Uh, trauma-informed content, and they approve the entire 40-hour curriculum. So for the last 20 years, that's kind of been my main bread and butter, you know, um, of speaking for them, and I travel throughout the state, and I do online uh, so Parents Tool Shop then, um, I, I've had that online since the internet began. I had a website, but then as technology has evolved, I've tried more or less effective, I should say less and now more effective ways of getting my programs online. Um, and I now finally have a really great um, site that I feel confident sending people to, uh, to take the courses um, and they can get coaching. And I have a free webinar every month and things like that. Oh, so, and I'll, I'll share some of that. I'll, I'll put some links um, and and share some of that with you yeah, uh, before we end and you can send folks there. Free yeah. free resources are always exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've done a lot now with trauma-informed parenting and that has been interesting because one of the things when I was developing Parents Tool Shop, you know, I researched all this parenting information and you know what I didn't find anywhere was how do you deal, when you're a parent, how do you deal with your own anger 
And how do you deal with your kid's anger? There wasn't anything. And I, when I was growing up, we were told to just sit down and talk about your feelings. And, and that worked for me. That happened to be my style. Well, then I have this little boy who's very aggressive and very physical and not very verbal. And I, I want to say to him, use words when you're angry. And I thought that's the most ridiculous thing to say to a two or three year old who doesn't you know, talk. And I'm like, what am I supposed to say? What? And that was really the beginning of what has ended up being the biggest expansion in the research that I've done has been around um, anger. It started with anger and stress management. And then that kind of led into brain science. And then that led into things like quantum physics and law of attraction and all, mm-hmm. all from a science base all from a science base. That so it's been really fascinating wow. because my personal development kind of went in that direction. And then I saw with trauma, I saw with parenting, how I would be able, how that could transform those and bring, move those forward. And I have, I, I have a way of being able to explain pretty complicated, what people would call woo-woo stuff. Yeah. I have a way of being able to explain that in a way that actually makes sense. And so I even trained caseworkers. I just did this the other day. It was a six-hour training. It's I, I wish I had six weeks uh, because I used to have a six-week program in person. That's just kind of unrealistic online for, for one sitting. But I just did a six-hour one the other day and, and helping to explain, you know, how adverse childhood experiences literally change our body, how it literally affects that and how that then, you know, can affect the rest of our lives. So... Yeah, so this whole, um, kind of the whole anger and stress and trauma and all of that has really evolved. That's probably been the area that my practice has evolved the most. Wow. Yeah. And and I'll just mention as a side note, people came to me and said, I want to teach your classes. So I also have a certification program. So people can get certified and they can teach live classes in their area. They can do coaching on my side. And so I'll just toss that out. There's kind of a way of wrapping up the story. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No, that's fantastic. I love that, though, because then that goes great into, you know, the, the anger. I feel like that's something that a lot of parents do talk about. That's something that comes up. What do you feel that parents need the most right now? Like, what is what is something that parents are just, you see, oh, I need, you know, fill in the blank. What, what Especially is- now post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, most of us that were, so post-pandemic, everybody needs to be trauma-informed, period. Hands down, capital letters. Before the pandemic, you know, about the only ones of us that were kind of talking about trauma were the ones who were dealing with trauma, you know, whether that was adults who have experienced it and now, you know, how did that affect them now or kids, you know, and and of course, I'm in protective service. So obviously working with foster parents and how do you parent children with trauma? When the pandemic hit, it was like I saw everybody experiencing stress reactions on a chronic level. And when you have stress, on a chronic level, it turns into what Yale, uh, what Harvard calls toxic stress. And mm-hmm. toxic stress has the same effect on the body as trauma, as complex trauma, of uh, uh, level two trauma. So level one trauma or type one, whatever you want to call it, is like one thing happens. It's extreme, but it only happens once. When something happens on a chronic basis, it doesn't have to be big. Um, if my hands are you know, like, this is zero, your baseline, and, and this is a 10, it could only be like a three, four, or five. But if you have it every single day, your body literally starts to change because those stress hormones are maintaining a level up here. So now your body gets used to that. And what happens is that now your baseline is no longer at zero. Now your baseline is at that three or four. So then when you experience a stress, you go up to like a five, six, or eight. Well, now you really feel more stressed about things than you did before. And and during the pandemic, I heard people, I mean, out in, you know, national TV, you know, where like out in the public, everybody was starting to talk about how they were almost feeling like this was becoming a traumatic event for them. So now I feel like today, everybody needs to be trauma-informed. I wished everybody was trauma-informed before, but now I feel like everybody needs to be more trauma-informed. And and so that's something that I um, have incorporated more of, even when I'm just kind of teaching folks basic stress, anger and stress management. I'm tying in a little bit more how stress is related to trauma and how the body experiences that in a very similar way. I I 1000% agree. When when everything started to happen with the pandemic, 
and people started to quarantine kind of when that happened, I looked at my husband, I said, this is not going to be a physical health crisis. This is going to be a mental health crisis because yeah. everyone will be affected by this. Not everyone physically, but everyone will emotionally. Yes. And the thing is, is that those two aren't separate. When something affects you emotionally, those emotional biochemicals that you experience in your body, that is physical. That's and when true. we yeah, have those true. on a regular basis, it literally changes the cellular structure. Yeah. And that's called cellular memory. And because this pandemic lasted so long, it literally, people have felt it literally has changed their bodies in terms of what, what their baseline is, what their stress tolerance is, um, how they handle things. So there's so many things that it's affected. And then, you know, of course, those of us maybe who had a support system or had a family, I really missed, you know, I was an empty nester. I really missed not having, you know, having a family and my kids right there. I think I would have been fine, you know, if it had been you know, back when I had kids, we were just this, not, we could be this nice little insular world, you know, like we, we all got along, we had, but it was really hard, you know, to be separated from support systems. And I felt really bad for maybe singles, you know, who yeah. couldn't get out and they couldn't see this person or, you know, yeah. so it's really been incredibly stressful and we weren't really prepared for it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Not, not for that, all. to that long at that level. Yeah. yeah. Not at all. No. Well, and another conversation that I, I had um, with my husband, too, was I, I think about our children and we were extremely mindful in the actions that we took. Because, for example, my youngest is five right now. So oh. a good half of her life, she has lived through this. My oldest is nine. He was already in school. So he also lived through a lot of that. So we intentionally took a lot of family walks. We would, you know, go to places that we felt were, we were comfortable with. We tried to still incorporate things that brought us joy. And that was really a, a challenge, you know, for people for a long time too. But we really, I was very, very particular with that. I thought we need to get out yeah. and do these things when we can and enjoy it. Yeah. So. My grandkids are nine and four. So said very yeah. similar. And my grandson is just starting kindergarten this year. And he's definitely a pandemic baby. He was just an infant, you know, when it started. So he's never been away really from his mom. You know, mm -hmm. um, she was a school teacher and, and um, the year when that ended, that September before the pandemic, um, she just decided to, it was a very toxic work situation. And so she want, thought, well, I'll just teach somewhere else. And then she didn't get a job. At that time, it was a, <laughs> you know, teaching, getting a teaching job was a lot harder. And so she said, well, I'll just nanny this year. And he's still only like four or five months old. Like I'll, I'll just stay home. You know, I, I, I get to be with him another year and then the pandemic hit. So she was nannying. So at least the kids had other kids to be around. It was only a couple of other kids, but at least they had other kids to be around. And, and so at least we were grateful for that. But yeah, it definitely, even the nine-year-olds, I'm sure your, mm -hmm. uh, your nine-year-old also, it really, you could tell it really affected them. Yeah. So we are seeing evidence of trauma in kids who traditionally we wouldn't think need trauma-informed parenting. Yeah. You know, we are seeing those signs and parents who, parents who know that they're parenting a child with trauma, like a foster parent or an adoptive parent, or even a parent who knows their child's had a trauma, when you're tuned into that, you consider that, you look at things through that lens and you consider that in terms of interpreting their behavior, in terms of how you handle it, because you can't do the same kinds, you know, if you yell at a child, um, for their behavior, which might not be any big thing, you know, with kids who don't have trauma, the kids who have trauma and their baseline is already up, they're already anxious. And mm -hmm. then we yell at them. It, it, I, and I don't want to, um, to demonize yelling because I was a yeller. As you can tell, I have a loud voice. It doesn't take much for me to be at a yell. So I can just be excited and people say, quit yelling. And I'm like, I'm not yelling. So, so I'm not being critical of yellers at all. I'm, I'm among that group. But really being conscious about things like volume and the words that we say and what are we doing to, uh, is our response reducing the stress level or is it contributing to the stress level? Yeah, so when we aren't 
when we're stressed, then it contributes to their stress. And so pretty, I, I would, I would feel it's safe to say almost all kids right now have some level of trauma. Yeah. And because I, I, I and I, uh, despite what anybody has tried to do, I think just the nature of what we've been through has left almost everybody with some level of trauma. It might just be a little bit, you know, um, and we're and we're getting through it. And now that we're beyond it, we're starting to feel more normal and all of that. But there's a lot of kids that are really having some lasting effects. And it doesn't take much. I don't think we're even far enough out from this that if something happens, that it might not have setbacks, you know. Right. Yeah, that yeah. we're getting better, but we're not all the way there. And so if something happens, we're seeing kids with trigger buttons. We're seeing parents with trigger buttons, yeah. you know, <laughs> and these trigger buttons, traditionally, we have thought of as just being when someone had trauma, but it's not just trauma, it's toxic stress. And we've all been through toxic stress. That's what the pandemic was. Well, and it wasn't just the pandemic. I mean, no matter what side of, of any kind of politics, religion, anything else, everyone agrees. It's really stressful out there in the political, religion, you know, all that kind you know, all that is out there. Law enforcement, you know, there's a lot of stressful stuff going on out there. So it isn't just the pandemic, it's all these other things. And so that becomes part of that chronic, you know, well, yeah, this part's going better, but I'm still having to deal with this. Or let's say the color of my skin means that, you know, I'm feeling stress over this, you know, so there's all these these other things that when you put those together, everybody's really dealing with some pretty significant stress right now that translates into symptoms of trauma. Yeah. So it's helpful to know how to how we can stay calm and how we can be more not just trauma informed, because I do think that's important. And I actually have a, a webinar and, and it's free and I'll share it with you. It's called Trauma Informed Parenting 101. And it's like what I think every parent needs to know, even if you think your kid never had trauma. Um, so I'll, I'll look that up and put that um, give that link to you. But um, so that's one piece of it, but just even um, that I think is helpful for everyone to know so that they recognize signs and they can just parent in general in a way that doesn't accidentally contribute to that or trigger that. And then I think we also need to, for ourselves and then pass on to our kids, how do we de-stress, um, whether it's preventive, stress management, or when we get triggered, how do we kind of come back yes. down from getting triggered how can we help kids regularly and then teach that to our kids yes. yes yes so what do you feel like are some of the best best ways to do that so there's a general format that you want to follow um there's a there's a um an image um it's Katie Malinsky, she has this thing called Ark of the Tantrum. And I honestly have not read any of her book or anything. I just like this one image that she has, but it's like the Ark of a Tantrum. And if we take tantrum out of there, it's whenever someone goes into dysregulation, there's time before the trigger occurs. This is when we want to do teaching of skills. We want to connect, we want to communicate, we want to teach the skills, and we want to get kids in the practice of doing them every day. One of the things that happens, I'm going to put my hands up to the screen again. One of the things that happens is that when our stress level goes up and we do those techniques, it brings it back down. Well, if we have gotten our stress level is so chronic that now our baseline is higher, the only way for that to come down is for us to do those self-regulation things even when we're not stressed. So when we're not stressed, it's then it starts to have a cumulative effect on getting our baseline down. So number one, we want to learn about this stuff ahead of time, practice it ourselves, start teaching it to our kids and do it regularly. That's before there's ever a problem. Then when there's a trigger, um, then we want to try to help connect, engage and co-regulate which is help kids practice what they learned. Sometimes it just happens so quick, they're up in dysregulation. When they're in complete dysregulation, their brains are offline. Um, yeah. So let me Very give you zone. another, <laughs> let me give you another um, hand uh, visual here. Um, and you guys can all go look this up at uh, Dan Siegel and it's Dan, S-E-I-G-E-L, I -E -E -L, I believe. Yes. So are you familiar with his hand model of the brain? I'm and thinking other, of the the um, volcano is what I think of. Okay. About the volcano. But, okay. Yeah. Way back in 92, that was my original. I still had used the volcano mm -hmm. for, um, there's two different kinds of volcanoes. At, at least this is parents tool shop 
you know, circa 1992 to today, um, smoldering embers are when one thing happens and then another and then another, and you don't quite de-stress from one before the next one happens. So you get this buildup and then something stupid happens. That's the cram the straw that breaks the camel's back and then you overflow. Mm -hmm. The other kind of volcano is what I call a flash fire. Those are trigger buttons. You're at zero and something happens and boom, you're like a hundred, zero to 150 in a split second. Those are trigger buttons and those need deprogrammed. Yes, when you get triggered, you know, you got to calm down from them, but you're going to keep getting triggered until you deprogram that trigger button. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a whole different issue. Um, in terms of what happens when we, when anyone um, uh, is under stress, it, it and here I'm, I'm going to put my hand. So Dan Siegel's uh, hand model of the brain, and, and I'm going to do a little bit of child of brain development real quick here. And then we'll talk about what happens with all of us. So this very part, bottom part of the brain, the primitive part of the brain, that's the fight, flight, freeze. That's also, it's the first part of the brain to develop. And that's the part that is involved with attachment, bonding, safety, security, knowing that my needs are going to be met. And so this is why, and it's the first level and all the rest of development builds on that. So when kids have um, poor attachment, they have stress happening during that year, it can affect their sense of safety. Um, so that's that's one thing to keep in mind. So that's age one. Then from one to six, um, this middle part of the brain is the limbic system. That's the emotional part of the brain. That's the next part of the brain to develop. Um, and so this is why under age six, we still see a lot of trigger buttons, which is fight, flight, freeze, and emotional tantrums and dysregulation and not being able to know how to handle emotions because that part of the brain is still developing. It's not until the age of six that the logical part of the brain even starts to develop. And that is the cortex. And that takes until age 25 to 30 before that's fully developed. And the, pr the prefrontal cortex is that executive functioning part of the brain. So here's a, a, a crazy proven statistic. So when scientists studied brainwave frequency, put, put um, you know, the little electrodes and red brainwave frequency, children from ages one to six are the same brainwave frequency as an adult in a hypnotic trance. Everything they experience from zero to six is getting directly downloaded into their subconscious, not in their conscious brain. The conscious brain is here, this logical part. If something happens to you, let's say we're going out to lunch and somebody calls you an idiot. Are you gonna take that in and go, oh, I must be an idiot? Well, of course not. Your logical brain is going to go, I know I'm not an idiot. And anyone who calls me an idiot is an idiot, right? <laughs> like we would logically, right? We would logically not take that on. Kids zero to six, that gets directly downloaded into their brain. And we've seen this, right? We know that kids that age are little sponges. Yeah. It's everything is input from zero to six. Like everything. Exactly. It's all input. There. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what ends up happening, so so now you got to take in mind where a child is in brain development in terms of when they get stressed, what part of the brain they may be acting out of, because if it's under six, you're not going to have any real logic, right? With adults, let's anything in between there with adults, what happens is that when this bottom part of the brain gets activated, it Dan Siegel calls it flipping your lid. It takes that logical part of the brain offline. And then everybody, whether you're an adult or you're a child, are kind of operating out of this fight, fight, freeze, emotional reaction part of the brain. And what helps bring the, the logical part of the brain back online is self-regulation skills. <laughs> so that's why it's so important for us to learn them, for us to teach them to kids, for us to do them regularly with them. So when they're in dysregulation, their lids are flipped. All we can do is co-regulate. It is impossible. No, no parent has ever successfully logically talked their kids out of a tantrum. <laughs> not what not you know not when their lids are truly flipped right there's That's no so logic true. to it i'm laughing I, it's not funny it's true like it's very yes and it's like why it we, happen. yeah it's like why are I, why am i trying to lock don't even try just co-regulate in other words hold them help them feel secure right help them feel secure help them calm those emotions give a name to the emotions help do deep breathing with them it'll help you calm down it'll model for them calming down and then that starts to take you down the other side of the arc yeah. So now there's some calming down. Great. Just keep doing that. Keep co-regulating while they learn self-regulation. And on the back end of it, once the lid is back on, once the logic is back on, once they're calm, 
then you can communicate again about, wow, what happened? Or what do we need to do differently? Or, you know, you broke a vase, what are we going to do to replace it? You know, that kind yeah. of, whether it's discipline or problem solving or whatever, you do that on the back side of it right. when everybody else is calmer. And that totally makes sense. And I feel like even kind of working with it a little bit in the moment, like the mindfulness of what's happening too, is really helpful because I, I've heard people say, and I've tried the 10 deep breaths with your kid, 10 deep breaths. I found out very quickly, 10 is way too many for my kids, both of them, five max. Yeah. Five. And I let one of my favorite <laughs> things. So if we teach them that, you know, the, the, the deep breathing, right. The diaphragmatic breathing, the, you breathe in, hold for two, exhale for four, that's 10 seconds. And if they just trace their finger five times, I call it the five finger breath. That's less than a minute, right? 10 seconds times five is 50 seconds. Even, even with adults who will say, I don't have time for the, you know, I don't have time to calm down. Do you go to the bathroom? Are you there for more than a minute? Do you think you could take five? Like everybody has one minute. Everybody has one minute. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's one of my favorites for kids and they can do it at their desks. If at school, like put their hand under, yeah, take a deep breath, a you know, and the yeah. tracing of it, you know, it might start out pretty quick, but if they can control the breath and why deep breathing is so important. I mean, there's all kinds of physiological things that it triggers in terms of biochemicals in the body, but the two that are really practical, number one is that it helps bring that brain back online. Um, and when you can do that consistently enough, it is the basis of all other anger and stress management techniques is deep breathing. Deep breathing is the basis of meditation prayer, you know, anything, you know, visual, whatever you want to do, exercise, deep breathing is the key to everything. So that's why that's such an important and powerful tool to teach kids. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think of the quote, it's, it's the one thing you have that's throughout your whole life, you know, that, that's it. Like come, just come back to it. Yeah. And there are different kinds of breathing, you know, um, our, our body uh, automatically causes us to breathe. We don't have to think about breathing. We do it, but it doesn't have the same effect as that real intentional deep breathing. Mm -hmm. So I do teach folks, you know, how, well, and like, I know when you're um, really stressed and nervous, like you're going to give a speech, your breathing, your throat will be all constricted. It's like your breath is clear up here. Then if you can even get it to your chest is good, which is where most people are breathing, but we're talking about going all the way down to the diaphragm and the stomach. And so I have a resource um, that has all kinds of resources for teaching kids anger and stress management skills. And one of them mm -hmm. uh, is the five finger breath. Uh, one of them is um, how to teach kids how to put their hands on their stomach and learn, imagine it's a balloon and then, you know, yeah, do the deep breathing, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, some visual fun ways of teaching kids that. Get them. Yep. Get them involved. Well, yeah. speaking of, if you could encourage families as a whole, you know, so parents, just the whole family to strengthen one foundation right now, what would that be and, and why? Um, what I would probably encourage, well, so at the very least, it, it, it would just be for everybody to know how to do deep breathing. But I actually have a system. So so here's the thing. What works for me doesn't necessarily work for you. Um, when, when my son was little and he was being physically aggressive and couldn't talk, for me to say to him, calm down, uh, sit down and talk about your feelings was ridiculous. That was the, that was the opposite of what he seemed to naturally need to do when he was upset. And that was the beginning of my, of my exploration of this whole, this whole, you know, aspect of life that took me in all those different directions. But what that specifically, and what I brought into the parenting curriculum that I teach um, is another system. And that is how to, all you have to do is figure out two things and you can identify what kind of an anger and stress management uh, program would work best for that person. Mm -hmm. So what I encourage families to do is identify what each person's style is, have them come up with some options that they can do within their style, and mm -hmm. then maybe even have a code word, you know, of, um, you know, when we say fuzzy pickles, you know, it can be any code word, yeah. but it means chill time, you know, or whatever. We each go and do our thing. Um, and, and basically, and, and I'll, the, the resource I'm going to give you has a link to the, to the slide um, of doing this, and it, it actually has the, um, I'll give them 
give you guys a, a free webinar on it. I'll give you the chapter from it. I'll just give oh, all that wow. to you for free. Yeah. Um, but it's basically two things. One is where do you need to go? And the other is what do you need to do? Where you need to go depends on where you get your energy. Um, and I feel like I don't have to explain what I mean by energy with you. I know. <laughs> so, or exactly your audience. What you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So it's where do you get your energy? Um, and we all feel Im imbalanced at times. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, if you have a pretty typical routine day, you're going to predominantly be one or the other. It's either you get your, your energy from within and you, that's a person who at least, at least once a day has to kind of be left alone. Mm -hmm. They've got to have their space. They've got to be left alone. They they are not necessarily introverts. And this is the big myth about the internal versus external recharge energy. External is I get my energy from outside myself. Um, mm -hmm. So when I'm stressed, um, if I'm an external recharger, just being around people or getting out and doing something, being by myself increases my anxiety. Being around or at nature, TV, people I draw my energy from outside myself yes us me, external energy people really struggle during COVID <laughs> yes yes and so and and it isn't so for example my son is an internal recharger but he is socially an extrovert he has lots of friends sense, he, yeah. yeah throws parties is the is the one that introduces everybody at the party but if he doesn't get a little bit of alone time every day he gets very stressed and I used to tell my daughter it's kind of like he's a bear in a cave and he's gonna growl at you if you bother <laughs> him when he needs his alone time my daughter on the, is that way like yes. yeah yeah my daughter, on the other hand, she's definitely an external recharger. When she is stressed, she'll call me to talk. She'll go take the kids to a playground. But she is a painfully shy introvert. She thinks the pandemic is the best thing that ever happened because now she can go online to order food, pay for it online, and they'll deliver to her door without her even having to open the door. So for her, this is like a dream come true that she doesn't have to interact with people. But when she's stressed, she, she wants to get out and go and do. And just getting out and doing those things helps her calm down. But she doesn't talk to anybody when she's there. She's just, you know, yeah. so this energy. So that's the first. Where do you need to go? And there's people like me who, like today, I'm, I'm doing this and then I'm training and I'm doing something else where I'm going to be exchanging energy all day long. At the end of the day, I usually am going to be on a day like today, I'm going to be more internal. I'm going to need a little bit of alone time, you know, tonight. If, however, all I was doing all day long was writing my book or something like that, and I had no interaction with anyone, then I would kind of want, I would feel imbalanced that maybe I'd want to go out and do something or talk to someone or whatever. Yeah. So you can, in, in any given moment in time, you're one or the other. And if you have a pretty regular schedule, you might be more predominantly one than another, but there are some, it's more helpful to recognize what do you need in that moment. Yes. So that's the one piece. So that's the first part, which is where to go. What you do when you get there depends on how your energy is manifesting in your body. Um, so if you have anger and stress, anger and stress energy, and mm -hmm. that's building up, that volcano starting to build up, how do you feel that and what would give you relief? And the three different ways are one is verbal, which isn't just talking, it's anything expressive. So it can be creative outlets, art, mm -hmm. anything. So that would be um, expressive, um, physical which would be doing something physical. You have a physical buildup and you've got to physically do something. And then there's a combo. Um, the way I describe it in the negative that it comes out with anger is yelling and screaming, cussing. That would be the verbal. Uh, physical would be slamming doors and stomping, you know, and mm -hmm. verbal physical is you yell and, and slam the door as you stomp out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so once you get those, once you identify where to go and what to do, you basically have six different categories. You have internal, verbal, external, verbal, internal, you know, you have the different categories. And my, the key to what works for people is to identify which of those categories somebody is in and then brainstorm ideas within that category. What I was doing with my son was telling him to do something in a completely different category than how he was wired. So, sense, yeah. so if we identify what works for each person, then we can brainstorm. So where can you go? What can you do? When we're home, 
our ideas can be very similar. Um, I often talk about angry cleaners. Uh, angry cleaners are internal physical, that, and so they like to clean when they're mad or when they're stressed, they clean, and that's a physical thing they can do by themselves. If they're external, they can go do something with someone else, something physical, walk with someone else, take a class. Same thing with um, internal verbal would be like journaling. External would be talking to someone. Um, so, so there's different categories of that. So what I would encourage families to do is take the time when you're not upset and identify what is what would be helpful for each person, come up with a plan, and then have their code word. The only thing I would add to that is with kids going back to school, kids need a plan for what they can do in the classroom. Yes. Because if they're an external recharge, let's say they're external physical, which means getting out around other people and doing something physical, what that's going to manifest in the classroom is that when they're upset, they get up and they walk around and they talk to other people. Yeah. And then they're going to get in trouble for that. Yeah. So <laughs> we've got to brainstorm things that they can do in the classroom. And fortunately, a lot of schools are creating um, little corners of the room that are like sensory corners yes. or recharge corners. And they have activities for both of those, both the creative, as well as, you know, there might be a stress ball, you know, something like that. So then all you all you got to do with kids is if they're internal, have them kind of tune out everybody, go kind of in that space, mm -hmm. tune everybody else out. If they're an external recharge, have them do whatever they're doing, but allow them to look at the class. Just looking at the classroom gives them some of that external recharge energy, mm -hmm. and that will help them calm down. That's fantastic. I love those because that's exactly right. There's a lot of teachers, at least here where we are, where they're kind of in charge of their classroom and where things are. And most all of them that I can think of have some sort of space like that um, for, you know, at least a group, you know, at least a big enough section to have at least one or two kids in at a time. And I think they might rotate them if things happen, et cetera. But yes, no, that's fantastic. So I, I feel like that's that's something that's kind of led up to that maybe wasn't seen previously. So it makes me think about yeah. what changes do you see for parenting in the future? What do you see as up and coming? I think everyone is going to, by necessity, become more trauma informed. I think people are going to not have the stigma that trauma is something that that they're going to understand that there's not a judgment that comes with trauma that it's a biological reaction to stressors and when they understand it from a scientific standpoint and recognize how it happens and the actual control that we have over it. I think one of the things that's really distressing for everybody is when we feel that we, we our bodies are reacting in a way that we can't control. And then we say things like, well, I can't help it. That's just how I feel. I can't do anything about it. That's just, you know, well, I had this happen to me as a kid, so therefore I'm not responsible for this. And when people understand how trauma actually works mm -hmm. and how to treat it, which is basically how to bring that baseline back down, mm -hmm. and then how to manage that, it is so empowering to realize that you actually have a lot more control in your life. You are so empowered because little things like how you think literally affect how you feel. And then how you feel literally affects the cells of your body. So mm -hmm. if you just change how you think, that, you know, so just simple, it's, it's, what's amazing is that people think it's very complex in some ways, but in way, but in most ways, it's really just very simple. Um, it, it, and complex can still be simplistic in a way too, but I think that's the biggest key. And I think that I see folks heading there, but they're coming there from different directions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people who are coming from it from trauma, and then there's other people who are coming from it from mindfulness. And mm -hmm. then there's other people who may be coming at it from religion or prayer or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that we will, I think that in the future, we will all be more understanding about how our bodies and brains work mm -hmm. and using that in information in an intentional way to not only heal our past, but to be able to be empowered to more self-direct our future. And that is exciting. 
That is so exciting. Well, I know that everything that you said has really resonated with me today. So I'm sure that there's going to be people who want to connect with you. So how can they connect? So my main website is parentstoolshop.com. Um, all of, and, uh, you know, you can just kind of uh, get directed there. Um, I would encourage folks, uh, if I have a free webinar every month, that's at parentstooltalk.com is my, it's been a podcast and a radio show, but it's a, a monthly free webinar. I also have one for foster parents. Um, my Facebook and, and, and is, uh, I think it's the parents tool shop. Let me look at that one. I, I pulled up one of these because I know one of these has a the in it. No, it's my YouTube channel is the parents tool shop. My Facebook is just parents tool shop, I believe. And then of course I've got, you know, um, uh, foster parents tool shop, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I have lots of um, um, other countries, you know, who have implemented it and that kind of thing. But yeah, it is just parents tool shop on Facebook. Um, all one word. But I encourage folks, you know, connect with me. I've got a ton of free resources. There's a membership group um, over at my e-library, which if you click on programs or products, it'll take you over to that e-library. And if you sign up for, actually, it's on Parents Tool Shop. There's a link there to uh, join the membership. If you become a free member, then um, I'll send you information about our events each month. But you also get access to not only a whole bunch of free resources, which everybody can get for free, and the, they're kind of all, they'll be put into your account. But then you also get access to some uh, that might be fee-based. And most of my webinars, um, because we offer certificates and that kind of thing, might only be five or ten dollars it's not real expensive mm -hmm. um, but I do do my online class um, it has been in such high demand that I videotaped it and so I actually have my live in-person class recorded um, and so I have you know an intro basic the basic one actually has my book that hasn't come out yet mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be launching a new book um, soon I was I, I'm not even going to give a date now because I <laughs> was starting to launch when we hit into the pandemic oh. I feel like I've hit, hit so many you know I, I kind of want to wait until things a little bit smoother and then I was moving my website over here anyway uh, but you can get that by taking the basic program um, and then the advanced program um, you can take and you can always opt to have um, coaching um, and I, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and and all of that really good stuff so I can help you personalize the plan to your family's needs. Wow that's fantastic well it's been so wonderful chatting with you today thank you so much Jody. You are very welcome and thanks for inviting me. And I look forward to connecting with your audience in deeper ways in the future. Yay, wonderful. Have a great day. Thanks, Christy. Bye everybody, thanks.